Welcome back to Pop Dissected. Today, we're going to be talking about Katy Perry's third studio record, Prism, and how she soared to new heights with the record, seemingly impossible after the immense success of Teenage Dream. Celebrating seven years of release this past week, we're going to see how Katy Perry was able to leverage her popularity for another two-year record cycle and craft a record that serves as the crown jewel of her discography. Now, for starters, by no means did Prism out-achieve Teenage Dream, but Prism was able to warrant Katy new ways of success in different areas of her career. Though Katy Perry wrapped up the promotional cycle for Teenage Dream on January 22nd of 2012, with the close of her California Dreams tour, she would go on to extend the lifeline of the era until December of that year. With a reissue of Teenage Dream, a number one single post-divorce, her wide awakening following 18 months of fantasy, a documentary, and countless festivals, this era was milked for everything it had. And it would only be eight months before Katie emerged back onto the scene at the 2013 VMAs. Though there's a three-year gap between Teenage Dream and Prism, this was undoubtedly in her favor. In the mid to late year of 2012, Katie had stated she knew the tone, coloring, and mood of her forthcoming third studio record, and said it was going to be a very dark record, and she also made claims it would be more acoustic as well. She additionally noted it would be impossible to try and redo Teenage Dream, and she would let the music take shape in conjunction with the record itself. She recognized her foundations had crumbled following her heartbreaking divorce, and through the countless performances and promotion, she was still in a very dark place, and was so when she began recording in November of 2012. However, upon writing sessions and recording of By the Grace of God, the only track to specifically speak on her divorce from Russell Brand, Katie's intent with the record had generally shifted. The session of this track prompted Katie to change gears and opt for a lighter record. As she had to let the light into her own life and let go of her own pain she was carrying around, she decided to make that the core focus of her record and project that out into the world. Recording resumed in March of 2013, and by May, Katie had felt she had prepared enough to release the record towards the end of that year. And in July, a golden truck with the title and release date of Katie's third studio record began driving around the country. Within the coming weeks, Katie would tease the seemingly dark lead single off Prism, Roar. Putting her teenage dream era to death, it seemed we were getting the dark era she had promised. Though upon the single's leak and quick early release, we came to learn Roar was the opposite of dark. And this is where I think Katie actually played a really smart, interesting move. In a way, Katie trolled everyone with not only promising a dark record, but having these morbid teasers as well. The upbeat, poppy track served as the total antithesis to this. It was a shock for sure, and I think the surprise of that definitely added to the track's success. After debuting at 86 on the Hot 100 from just radio airplay, the song shot up to number two, with 557,000 copies sold, her highest first week sales of a track ever. The track would go on to be her third Diamond certified single, leading her to be the only artist to achieve this. In short, Roar began the Prism era with a bang. Katie had proved she was back and bigger than ever. With Roar now cementing Katy Perry as the queen of uplifting pop anthems, it told more on the conception of the Prism record. If Teenage Dream was built upon this high concept of nostalgia, youthful bliss, and candy-coated dreams, Prism would tell of an organic, vulnerable journey into womanhood. This only made sense. Though Katie could have opted to progress with a dark record, the inevitable struggles of divorce and exhaustive scheduling would only lead to a record centered around introspection. The promotion for Prism leading up to its release is likely the most engaging we've seen from Katie herself at the start of an era. Not only were three listening parties held a month before the record's release, Katie additionally partnered with Good Morning America, and schools across the country would create their own lift up to Roar, in which the winning school would have Katie perform. Around the same time, Katie also released her third perfume, Killer Queen, which would go on to have three iterations throughout Prism's record cycle. Katie also partnered with Pepsi, encouraging fans to tweet a hashtag to unlock lyrics to Dark Horse and Walking on Air, which would both be later released as promotional singles, peaking at 17 and 34 respectively. For comparison, Teenage Dream's promotional singles 
Circle of the Drain and Not Like the Movies peaked at 53 and 58. And for the cherry on top, Katie released a limited edition digipack full of stickers and seed paper. Of course, there was also a standard and deluxe edition of Prism, the deluxe edition being a mini booklet with stories from Katie. All of this happened in a span of two months, in conjunction with many live performances. As opposed to the three month promo cycle of Teenage Dream, Prism's promotional cycle came in hot and heavy. But why does this matter? Well, success once it's earned is great, but it's even harder to maintain. Though Katie didn't necessarily go through a prolonged hiatus, she was gone long enough that when she came back, she had to hit fast and hard. The record's second single, Unconditionally, would be Katie's first single to miss the top three in four years, still peaking at a strong 14. A track proclaiming an unwavering love, the single was promoted just about as much as Roar. Skipping ahead, the track's final two singles, Birthday and This Is How We Do, would not receive any televised performances, the former only being broadcasted via satellite at the 2014 Billboard Music Awards and performed at the BBC Radio 1's Big Weekend. The tracks peaked at 17 and 24. Though the final singles off Prism didn't necessarily end the era on the highest note for releases, the third single, Dark Horse, proved to be one of the biggest pop singles ever, albeit one of Katie's strangest. Ditching her traditional pop-based sound, Dark Horse features Juicy J in a sassy, dark, hip-hop trap story of tempted love. Being nominated for 16 awards comparative to Roar's 14, Dark Horse might have actually been a dark horse. The track carried modest success following its release as a promotional single, and upon its release as an official single, it stayed 22 weeks in the top 10 and 52 weeks on the Hot 100, becoming Katie's best performing single on the chart. The track became one of her instant classics due to its standout production amongst its discography. However, the success of Dark Horse might have also hindered the singles that followed it. Though it's likely unconditionally had reached its final peak at 14, Dark Horse had already become a single at this time, thus the engagement with Unconditionally definitely began to waver. Dark Horse was still number three on the Hot 100 at the time Birthday was released, which was in April. Though Birthday was able to modestly climb, Dark Horse was still the Katy Perry song people wanted to listen to. With the popularity of Dark Horse still prominent and overshadowing Birthday, This Is How We Do being released four months later never really stood a chance since its predecessor wasn't of the caliber of Roar, Dark Horse, or even Unconditionally. Now for the record itself. Prism debuted at number one with 286,000 copies, her highest debut on the Billboard 200 ever. The record raked in four Grammy nominations, which were all lost, which we're not surprised by. Though the record received mixed reviews, it is generally Katie's most positively reviewed record. What was noted about the record was Katie's evolution as an artist. Teenage Dream was hallmarked by pop hits, pure fun, and creating a world to get lost in. Prism, however, is likely some of Katie's most authentic work. What stands out about Prism compared to Teenage Dream is the lack of the record being full of radio hits. While most of the radio-friendly tracks take up the front half of the record, the back half reflects a lens of maturity and reflection on Katie's own life. This in itself showed her transition into a more grown-up version of herself. She was finding herself as she approached her 30s, and tracks such as Love Me, By the Grace of God, This Moment, It Takes Two, and Ghost all present a different layer to Katie not extensively seen on her previous records. While nowadays Prism is recognized for its big hits, Roar and Dark Horse, the record at the time was very much seen for being a full body of work, a journey of a woman who found hope through despair, a theme we'd see again later in this year's Smile. With ample time to promote her record across the world, the Prismatic World Tour launched in May of 2014, seven months after the release of the record. The Prismatic World Tour became Katie's biggest tour, grossing $204 million across 151 shows with a 98% attendance rate. Now, it's obvious, Katie brought looks, props, choreography, spectacle, show-stopping moments, and iconic interludes. But I believe this tour had more going for it than beyond impressive staging. With the smash hits of Roar and Dark Horse, seven other iconic number ones under her belt, and a catalog of widely popular songs, this would be the tour to go to. 
At this time, every single one of her songs were known by everybody worldwide. She hadn't had a single that fell under the radar or severely underperformed. Simply put, this was Katy Perry's prime. While touring, Katy would go on to win 10 awards, all leading up to her highest career moment, her Super Bowl performance, bringing in 120 million viewers, being the most viewed halftime show to date. Then the era came to a close with her set list at Rock and Rio 6 in September of 2015, making the era last just a bit over two years. So I bet you're wondering, was Prism bigger than Teenage Dream? Well, as of August this year, we have updated US sales of Katie's singles and records. Teenage Dream has sold 3.1 million copies in the past decade, with Prism coming in at 1.7 million in the last seven years. With Firework boasting 7.4 million downloads sold, Roar and Dark Horse come in with a close 6.6 .6 and 6.4 million respectively. Now of course, these are pure sales, not including streams or track equivalent album streams. In total certifications, which I found from only verified sources, no crazy Twitter claims, Teenage Dream is eight times platinum and Firework is 12 times platinum. Both Roar and Dark Horse are certified 11 times platinum However, Prism is still said to be certified at two times platinum, but I'm going to gauge that may be higher because of streaming. So as we can see, though the Prism record may not be close to Teenage Dream since it hasn't been updated in quite a few years, the biggest singles off Prism are coming in very close to Katy's biggest hit. With 155 million total certifiable units, Katy Perry is the eighth most certified female artist of all time and the 30th highest overall. With this, what all has made Prism so successful? Katie came in hard with her promotion, managing to orchestrate numerous events in the two month lead up to her record upon the release of Roar. With the magnitude Roar had on the charts, she already had an incredible start to the era. With a legacy defining era behind her, it's safe to say Katy Perry's third record was highly anticipated, and the wait wasn't necessarily that long given the length of the Teenage Dream era. So while we had to wait for her, the wait wasn't so long she lost any sort of place in pop music. Roar showcased a classic Katie with an anthemic track, while Dark Horse showed her versatility of trying a new genre in a different type of lyricism. Thus, we got a blend of old and new. Her record showcased transformative growth of maturity, hallmarked by tracks about thinking in the past, self-love, and moving on. The tracks on Prism mix the fun hits of Teenage Dream with the more introspective down-to-earth ballads seen across one of the boys. Prism gave diversity not only in sound, but in tone and story. Prism additionally brought on a more cohesive sound, thus making it a much more pleasurable listening experience throughout the record. Though there's no clear narrative structure on the record, it delivers clear storylines with every track that clearly tie to a specific moment in Katie's life, which was very much her intent with each song. Then, Katie was able to launch her most successful tour to date, backed with old classics and new hits. She had the perfect setlist for a concert and brought the wow factor. Additionally, knowing her public struggles and her divorce, her strengthful triumph into choosing love and light made her all that more admirable. She was seen as a strong figure and a strong woman. This very much juxtaposed the fun, carefree, and maybe even reckless image we saw with Teenage Dream. Prism was Katie waking up from her teenage dream and finding hope and love in the future and what lies beyond it. Lastly, we have the Super Bowl, the event that was arguably just as sought after as her concert. Once more, we have the old hits, the new favorites, and a show-stopping spectacle. Though Katy Perry's peaks may have been reached already, through her hard work and extensive dedication, her achievements remain recognized. And no matter how any of her succeeding records perform or what she endures, she's proved she's got the eye of the tiger. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. Be sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn on that notification bell for more future content on all your favorite pop stars.